just kind of a little bit backstory about my life. I grew up outside of Owensboro, Kentucky, in a, in a small, uh, in a small uh, rural uh, country community, a farming community. I uh, had the privilege of going to church with my, with my family at a young age, and at a young age of 9 or 10 years old, I really did understand for the first time that Jesus Christ had died on the cross for my sins, that I needed my sins to be forgiven, and that I needed Him as my Savior. And so as a young kid, I trusted Christ as my Savior. I said, Christ, Jesus, that you are the Lord of the world, uh, and I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. And I received Him into my life. I gave my life to Him. He transformed my life at that point, and I became a new creation in Christ. But uh, during that process, in my little Baptist church, the little country church I was a part of, I didn't understand what it meant to walk with the Lord. I didn't understand what the concept of a relationship. I had formed a relationship with God, but I didn't understand how to have consistent fellowship. To have a sense of knowing what it meant on a daily basis to interact with Him. Uh, and uh, though I went to church every Wednesday night, every Sunday, every Sunday night, anytime the doors were open, I was there. Uh, but I just wasn't really able to grow like I wanted to. At the same time, my uh, father became an alcoholic. Um, he was a good man, a good father to me when I was up to probably until I was eight or nine years old. But by the time I was nine or ten years old, my father's drinking problem became an al became alcoholism. That turned us into uh, into a very uh, poor environment. My family, he lost his job, he wrecked our car. Uh, we actually moved farther out in the country. We had an old farmhouse that had an old country well there that we would get our water from. Our well broke, and so through high school, we had no running water in our house. I was the poorest kid in my school, just about. Uh, all my friends were uh, rich, or at least middle class and above, and smart. Well, I was one of the poorest kids in school, um, and I was decently smart. Primarily, I was just disciplined, and I just studied a lot because so I could compete with my friends. But not knowing how my relationship with God would impact my entire life, I developed a number of bad habits, uh, just not understanding. I had a terrible self-image. I used to stutter really bad, could talk well. And, I, and so because of that, because I was known as the poorest kid in school, or one of the poorest kids in school, I just didn't view myself very well at all. And then I internalized my anger and my pain uh, and became a very terrible temper. And so I, I battled constantly uh, all through junior high and high school. I would get in fights. I remember hit, hitting one of my good friends. I'm thinking, why did you hit this guy? He just called you a name, but I would lose control. And I, I would lose my temper. And then I'd go to church that Sunday, and I couldn't believe I lost my temper again. And I was on those classic aisle walkers. And I'd walk the pastor and say, you may want to recommit their life to Christ or rededicate their life. Oh, dude. And I'd run down the aisle, and I'd come down, and I'd pray, and the preacher would say, Thomas is rededicating his life again. And, and uh, sure enough, and that would last about a week or two, and then I'd lose my temper again, or I would get angry, and I would hit, hit my, do whatever. And my life was just in a constant up and down cycle, remarkably inconsistent. Um, no victory in the Christian life, no sense of victory over my thought life, especially no victory over my temper, over my anger. Uh, I was filled with rage ongoingly. Well, my temper came to a head my senior year in high school. I was in a senior biology class, or like a college prep biology course, as the top 20 kids in the school. I was number 16 out of about 400. And these were all my friends. Again, they were all smart and rich, and I was poor and disciplined. And we had this big test. Uh, it was a big biology test or test at the end of the semester. And I studied five hours for this test. And really thought, I'm going to ace this baby, I'm going to do well, and etc. Well, I took the test, thought I did okay. The next day, the prof uh, hands back, back our test. Uh, and he said, hey, he said, everybody in the class did well. Then he said, but Thomas. And I don't know why he pointed me out, but it, it just set me off. And all of them looked at Thomas, oh, we all did well. I made a 62 on this biology test. And I'd studied five hours. And in high school, that's a long time to study for, it's a long time for college, right? But especially in high school, that's a real long time to study for a test. And I just felt miserable. And I had no idea what else, what else he said that, that day. But internally, I was just furious. Not at him, but at myself. Almost goes back to what uh, Dr. Uh, Heather said a few minutes ago. My appearance. I didn't appear well. I, I, I wasn't performing. I wasn't a flun. I wasn't achieving. I was on the lower run in the class. And I internally was angry and just furious. And as I walked out the door in class, the, the teacher put his arm around me. And he said, Thomas, he said, what happened to you? And I said, I don't know, Mr. Powers. And I was in tears. And I said, I studied five hours for this stupid test. 
And then uh, as I got closer to the door, I basically swung and hit that door full force. He was here. I swung. Around. I wasn't aiming at him. I swung around him and hit that door as hard as I could. And I hit it with so much impact that my hand shattered. And these bones just disintegrated. Literally, they just, they just shattered. And he grabbed me. He said, are you okay? And I said, well, I think I broke my hand. And I said it that calmly because I was so angry it didn't even hurt. I was had so much adrenaline. And I grabbed it like this and I pushed it. And it sounded like this. And it was all these bones... And they just started crunching. And I said, yeah, I just broke my hand. You know, and, I, and, I, and, and then by the time I got to my locker, I realized, this is really hurting. And it really was. It was just, it was, it was, the pain was enormous because these two bones had, had, had been, had disintegrated, had been shattered. And then I had my senior ring on. My senior ring was a gift, was a gift from my mentor, a man that was helping to raise me, basically, had bought my senior ring for me. And I was pulling it, my bone wasn't attached. And so here I'm trying to get this ring off. And the finger's like Pinocchio. It's getting longer and longer. And I'm thinking, what in the world? And I thought, I'm going to have to have this ring cut off. So I got angry, more angry, and I hit the door with my other hand, my locker with my other hand, because I'm thinking, I can't believe this. I was so filled with anger, so filled with rage. I just couldn't handle it. Well, uh, I actually ended up uh, going to the doctor. They had to have surgery to correct the damage. I had to have a scar from here to here. And you can still see it. And they had to put pins and needles and all that kind of stuff in my hands to fix the damage and stuff. And I, uh, the irony of all of this was I was known in school, not as only as a poor kid and halfway smart, I was known as the Christian. I was the president of FCA in my high school. Everybody knew in school that I was the one that always went to church and read my Bible. And they're thinking, Thomas is flipped out. He's breaking his hand. And I gave the graduate, I gave the, at our senior banquet, I was asked to pray at the senior banquet. And I walked in my three-piece suit with my hand in a cast because I had just broken my hand. At graduation, I gave the graduation prayer at my high school graduation. See the irony of that? Here I am, known as the Christian, known as the person who knows God, but he can't control his temper. He can't control his life. His life's out of control. Can't you see? He's got a cast on his arm. And it's humiliating to get up there and in front of my peers and all their family and their parents and say, wow, yeah, look at me. I'm the Christian. I basically have, I can't control my temper in my life. When I got to college, I, said, I thought, something has to change. I cannot live this way. Because in college, you lose your temper, get in a fight, you may not walk out. I mean, I realized the intensity of basically the change that needed to take place in my own life. And as I said earlier today uh, in the main session, uh, I went to a Bible, got in the Bible study first, and I started meeting some friends that were involved in crew, and we started learning things, and I thought, this is remarkable. There's actually people that are really interested in spiritual things. And, and then I was at this seminar uh, as, as, on April the 14th, 1978, and I heard the guy say, the power that rose Christ from the dead lives in your life. Are you experiencing that power? And I thought, no. I'm losing my temper. You know, I can't control my thought life. You know, I hate my dad for what he had done to me. I have a terrible self-image. All that stuff. And I thought, is that supposed to be the Christian life? But when he made that statement, it transformed how I started to think. And what he start, what he communicated was simply how to live a Christ-centered life. How the God of the universe who comes and resides within your life, when you give your life to Christ, we are filled with Christ. And he wants to live in us and through us. The Christian life isn't, uh, isn't easy. Uh, it's impossible. Only Christ can live the Christian life. And he, only, and he can live in us and through us. So what I want to do this morning is kind of unpack that. I want to unpack basically kind of from a big picture. That whole con- I, I've called this before one time. From salvation to sanctification. Through the whole process you have notes that look like this. Um, and that's the whole picture that you have there. And we're going to start from the bottom on the bottom left-hand side, from the non-believer or the natural man, all the way to the very top right-hand corner, which is basically if that was to be, oh, that was the day before you die and go to heaven. That's where we're going to put you, okay, in that situation. And this is the, the intention of this talk is to give you a picture of what it looks like in the Christian life from one the person who's a non-believer to they come to the point of giving their life to Christ and growing consistently in their life on a holistic basis. Some of you may have heard of this before. We've got some guys from Chavis from the Daytona Beach with us. Somebody else was, 
they're hearing from the Tony, you know, Latham and others. And I gave this on summer project last summer. Commercial. If you don't have plans, even if you have plans, join us this summer at Daytona Beach. It's only for three weeks. It'll change your life. It'll be the best three weeks of your life. We were with each other this summer as well, last summer. Come join us. You will not regret it. I'll give you money to go. I'll give you $50. Any of you write me a letter. I'll send you $50 to go to, this, to Daytona. Only to Daytona because I'll be there. If all of you go, I'll take out a loan. But you know, my encouragement to you is, what are you going to do with your life? And we're going to look at this whole picture uh, with from, from basically from the non-believer all the way up to the point where a person where we, we go to heaven. So let's pray. I know, I know that Joey's already prayed for us. I'm going to pray again and ask God bless for time. Father, we do thank you for our time. Thank you that we get a chance to talk about the most one of the most significant events of history, and that's your resurrection, the, the significant event of history, your resurrection, and how that resurrected power lives within us. So Lord, I pray for myself. I pray that you would speak through me. Lord, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that you would live through me, that you would communicate today what only you can communicate, and that I would be filled with your Spirit in such a way that I can speak clearly and effectively, and I'd say what you want me to say and not say what should be said. And I pray for the individuals in this room. Lord, give them ears to hear, give them hearts and wills to want to obey. And may you help each of us to grow closer to you because of this time. And I pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. We see here, I'll unpack the whole, the whole thing. Does anybody else not have any notes? We have a couple more sheets if you need them. But with that said, we'll start. I have a question for you. How does a person go from the non-believer to the believer? On the far left-hand side, the, the circle is the person's life. The chair is their control center or the throne of their life. Who's in charge of their life? S stands for self, so self is on the throne. And the cross represents Christ, and Christ is outside this person's life. How does a person go from the non-believer to the believer, a person where Christ is in the life and is on the throne? And by the way, if, when you give your life to Christ, Christ takes the throne. He comes in as Lord of your life. He transforms your life. He becomes your master. He becomes your king. He becomes the one that you follow in life. How does that take place? I want to give you 10 seconds. And in 10 seconds, write on your piece of paper what verses you would share to say how the person goes from the left to the right. Ready, set, go. Ten seconds. Write it down. Five, four, three, two, one. And okay, some of you thought this is easy and you were thinking stuff. What are some of the verses you wrote down for those that was real quick for you? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Okay, what else? Pardon? John 1, 12. But as many of you uh, uh, do receive Christ and become a child of God. What else? Romans 3, 23. Good. Romans 5.23, Romans 6.23, all, all the Romans wrote verses that, that go in there. Surely you wrote down John 3.16, right? John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, some of you struggled with that. You thought, well, I don't know. You didn't know what verse to write down. And I want you to know that as a follower of Christ, I would and challenge you, I would encourage you to start memorizing Scripture. The first Scriptures I started memorizing were the Scripture that we're in, Knowing God Personally, or the Four Spiritual Laws booklet. And I just did it second nature. And I think over time, it will become second nature to you. But uh, even as Heather talked about, you may go for a walk with your friends, but if you don't know what to communicate, what are you going to say to them? And so you need to, you need to have committed to memory uh, verses of the Scripture that help you lead a person from the, a non-believer to a believer, basically. Now, the next question is, how does a person go back from a believer to a non-believer? I'll give you five seconds. Think of some verses. And it didn't happen. That's a trick question. And so if you did say that, then we need to have this as another talk. But I really believe that once a person gives their life to Jesus Christ, Christ comes into their life, they become a child of God. Romans 1.12 says that. But as many as received him, to them he gives the right to become a child of God, even to those who believe in his name. Once you're a child of God, you stay a child of God. Now you may not be, you may be a prodigal child, you may not be a, an obedient child. My, I'm, uh, I flew in yesterday to speak to the men. I speak to the day that I'm flying home tonight my, because my daughter uh, has been living in Japan for the last five years and she flew home for Christmas. Hadn't seen her in two years. Uh, she got married in April, got almost two years, got married in April a year and a half ago, two years ago. She came in just for Christmas to see us for a week. And now, even though I don't see my daughter, I, I Skype with her once a month or so in Japan, she's still my daughter. She may even do things that I may not necessarily approve of, though she doesn't. She's a great daughter. She, but even if she did, she's, she would still be my daughter. 
Why? Because her blood, my blood is in her life. She has been born of her mother and her father. And when you are born again, as it says in John chapter 3, you become a child of God. And Christ transforms your life. And so you really you don't go back in that way. You don't you don't basically you don't lose that relationship with God. But what does happen is you start to grow and mature. And so what I've done there is I've drawn that line, the line in the center, the red line, meaning you're either on the left or you're on the right. Either you know Christ as your Savior today or you do not know Christ as your Savior. Either, either you're a child of God, either you're a believer, or you're, not, you're a non-believer. Now let me ask this question for you. Some of you come here to this conference just checking it out. Maybe you came because someone volunteered to pay for you to come. Or maybe you came and you, and you don't know for sure about your relationship with Christ. I want to encourage you, please, don't leave this conference unless you, until you know that you know Christ as your Savior. That you have that sense of confidence that I'm His child and He is my Father. I may not always act like it and I realize I struggle, but Lord, you're my Father because you have died on the cross of my sins and I receive you as my Savior. And you're either on the left or on the right. And so even today, as we continue these next few minutes, if you need to make that decision, then make sure that you do so. Well, when that happens, when you basically go from being on the non-believer to the believer, you're doing what I call you're in the land of immaturity. You're a young babe in Christ. You're a young follower of Christ. You have just been birthed no different than if you've had a newborn child uh, and you already had, had, had children. And you become in the land of immaturity, and your objective is to go into the land of maturity. And it looks like, isn't that cool? I actually created that. I'm not very high tech at all, but I actually created that little man going back and forth like that. And because the objective in the Christian life is that you go from the land of immaturity to the land of maturity. Um, that is our calling before God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I mentioned this last yesterday to the men. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, We're to walk worthy of our calling. That you and I are to be people that, if we call ourselves the name Christians, we're to live like Christ. Not that we're going to be perfect, but we're to live like Christ. So you're, uh, I teach at Western Kentucky, and I teach leadership studies. And every semester in my leadership studies class, I had students, they have to write a paper and do a presentation on different leaders of history. They choose a leader and they give an eight to ten minute presentation about that leader, that leader and they write a paper about that as well. Uh, one did that, Alexander the Great. And I often had people give do Alexander the Great. And there's an interesting story about Alexander the Great that uh, is not talked about a lot, but it's that he was one of the greatest military leaders of history. And as a military leader, uh, he had a person had actually gone AWOL in his army, had left the battlefield, had deserted during the battlefield. And he basically, they found the person, and they took him, took him to Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great looked at him and said, I cannot believe what you have done. You've deserted our army. And then he said to the boy, he said, young man, what is your name? And he said, sir, my name is Alexander. His parents had named him after Alexander the Great situation. And Alexander the Great just became furious. And he said, son, either change your name or change your behavior. And I tell you, here, us in the Christian life, we're to call to walk worthy of the gospel. And we bear the name Christ. We're, little, we're Christians, little Christ. And are we living that out? Well, some of you are doing great. Others of you are really struggling with it. And so the power source to enable us to do so is what we're here to talk about in the midst of that. You tell me, what is necessary for a person to walk worthy of the gospel? Turn to groups of two or three. Two or three. And you just think through, what are the things that are necessary for a person to walk worthy of the gospel? They talk amongst yourselves and I'll bring you back in 30 seconds. Okay, give me some feedback. What is necessary for you and I to walk worthy of the gospel according to Ephesians 5, 4, 4 verse 1? Pardon? Community. community. That we have a sense of community. That we have people that will help us and that will encourage us. That sense we talked about that with the, in the man's talk as well. Good. Somebody else. What's, what's important to help you? Excuse me? Micah 6 a. Micah 6a. Well, what is righteous said that we would walk humbly and walk, uh, to love kindness, to love justice, and walk humbly with our Lord. Micah 6 a. That's kind of what God requires of us is to live that kind of a lifestyle. Good. What else? A healthy prayer 
a healthy prayer life, that we actually are people of prayer, that we have that sense of communication with God consistently, that we don't just have God talk to us, but that we talk to God and we have that communication perspective. Good. What else? Romans 6. Romans 6, that we put off the old and put on the new. The old, the old self has died and we have a new self. We have a new person in Christ. And the Romans 6 is a great passage for you to memorize, to study that passage, to, do, to process that passage. We're to know, reckon, and yield. We're to know that we're dead to sin and we're new in Christ. We're to reckon and soul. We're to count it to be true. And then we're to yield our life to Christ. That's the three big outlines of Romans chapter 6. No reckon and yield. Yes. A commitment to, to uh, uh, honesty and commitment. A sense of, a sense of commitment and honesty. Is that what you said? Okay, good. All right, great. Somebody else? Sharing the gospel. That we share the gospel. Not only do we grow personally, but that we're involved sharing our faith with other people. And I think that we, that, you know, you know why they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Because it's dead. You know why it's dead? And you get the Sea of Galilee, uh, and then it flows through the Jordan River. Into the Sea of Galilee flows in the Jordan River into the Dead Sea. You know why it's called dead? The Dead Sea is where you float on top of it. It's very, very salty. And you just can't, you can almost float on, you can almost walk in the water. It's so dense. You know why it's called this Dead Sea? There's no outlets. It's below sea level. Nothing flows out. And so the water stays stagnant. And most Christians struggle in their growth because they're like the Dead Sea. They get all this feed me, feed me, feed me, gimme, 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 but they don't give any output. They don't, they don't give out in their life. And if you don't have a resource out, if you're not sharing your faith or giving your life to others or, or, or communicating your faith to other people, then you become like the Dead Sea. It's like a sponge. A sponge needs to, to absorb more water. has to be squeezed. And that's what we need to be often that we're, that we're squeezed in life. All those things are crucial. There's the four things that, you know, it's prayer, God's Word, fellowship, and witnessing. Those four things are like four legs of a chair that God wants to use and will use in your life. Let me tell you, just because you're praying doesn't mean that you're walking in the Spirit. Just because you're reading the Bible or that you know the Bible doesn't mean that you're walking in the Spirit or walking with the Lord. Just because you're witnessing doesn't mean you're filled with the Spirit. I have led people to Christ not walking with God. Why? I mean, I didn't want to, but I was like that. Well, why does it work? Because God blesses the message, not the messenger. The message is true. The gospel is real. It will transform a person. And if you share the message, people respond. Now, often God allows us to experience that as well. But just because I'm doing those things doesn't mean I'm allowing Jesus Christ to live His life in me and through me. Now, I want to go back a second. What takes place in a person's life by the ministry of the Holy Spirit from the non-believer to the believer? I want to give you a couple of words to write down and a couple of verses I want you to write down as well because I think this is important as we understand what Christ has really done in our life. First of all, there's, a, there's numerous things that happen to you as soon as you give your life to Christ. Numerous things. There's four or five key ones. Uh, what does the Spirit do in John chapter 3, verses 6 and 7? And in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, it says that the Spirit regenerates our life. How are you a new person? How are you regenerated? God's Spirit is the one that regenerates your life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, uh, and in 6, 19, uh, we are told in Romans 8 and 9 as well, we are told that the Spirit of God dwells in your life. That God's Spirit lives in your life. We are indwelt with God's Spirit. So first of all, God's Spirit regenerates us. Secondly, God's Spirit indwells us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, it says that we are baptized in the Spirit. Who's baptized in the Spirit? Everyone who trusts Christ as their Savior. The word baptized means to be identified with. It's actually a term that means to dip. But it was used of a term where, back in the Roman culture, where a person would take uh, two things. One is uh, a soldier would take his sword, and he would take his sword before he went into battle, and he would dip his sword into a vat of blood. And he would dip that sword into a vat of blood and bring it out. And what he was saying is, I am willing to die. I'm identified with this battle, and I'm willing to die. It's also used uh, of, a clo of, a, of, a, of a clothing term where a person would take a piece of wool that would be white or gray or, you know, just with this basic wool, and they would dip that piece of cloth or that wool into a vat of dye, red dye or maybe burgundy dye or whatever color it was, maybe purple, and then they'd pull the cloth, they'd pull the, the cloth out, and what would happen? That cloth would look 
like the color of the dye. It identified with the cloth. And to be baptized in the Spirit means in our life that God has identified with, us, with, with, with Him. We have been baptized into His relationship with Him. We have been made a new person in Christ as He regenerates us. And another thing He does is He seals us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 4, verse 30, uh, all say that we have been sealed. That's not the animal. Eh, eh, eh. Not, the, not that kind of animal, not that seal, but sealed, meaning we have been, we have been, we have been stamped, if his life is stamped upon us, we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. Those are things that happen to you instantly. As soon as you trusted Christ as your Savior, you had no idea it happened. It happened. And there's other things as well, but those four key things took place. As soon as you went from the non-believer to the believer in life. And then the objective is that we walk in the power of His Spirit. So that our calling is to walk worthy. But there's a conflict that takes place. As you and I are walking, as we are moving along in the power of His Spirit, as we are going through the Christian life, going from point A to point B, there is a spiritual battle. It tells, it tells us that in Ephesians chapter 6. That we don't we don't wage war against the against the, the, the flesh, but against the but against the spiritual forces of darkness. But there's spiritual battle. There's three enemies for every Christian: the world, Satan, and the flesh. Romans chapter twelve, verse one and two tells us that the world we should not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind in Christ Jesus. That we're not to love the world or the things of the world. We're told of the flesh and that the evil nature, the sinful nature, has been crucified with Christ. It's been cru it is gone, but we still battle with those patterns. We still battle with those, those, those attacks. We still battle with the sense in our life of, man, I can't believe I still think that way. Or, oh, this is going because the old sinful nature is there doing war in our body. And lastly, there really is a sense that the Satan and the evil one. It says that the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, it says in James. And so as we're walking along this process, there is a conflict. And we have a choice to make. We have a point in the spiritual, this point of spiritual conviction, meaning this. You've been there. I've been there. You're tempted to think something or to say something. Then all of a sudden you think, I shouldn't say that. Or you say, man. Or maybe you did say that. And you think, man, I can't believe I did that. And as soon as you realize what you have done, God's Spirit convicts you either beforehand to stop you from doing it or once it's taken place in your life. And that, that God's Spirit convicts you. And if you respond to His conviction, that's part of the role of God's Spirit, it tells us in, in, in the book of John, is He convicts us of our, of our sin. If we respond to Him, we say, Oh, Lord, thank you for telling me that. I'm sorry I did that. It's not that you become sinless. But that as you sin, you realize God's convicting power is there. And it, sometimes it convicts you not to sin. Other, other times it convicts you when you have sinned. And then you realize, oh, I'll go back. And, you, and the process of the Christian life is we go from point to point to point. Now the role of the things that you just talked about, prayer, witnessing, the Word, community, what those things do are this. You meet, with, you meet with your Bible study, and as you're talking to the people in your Bible study, and you share with them, you know, I'm thinking about going out with Sue, or with, 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 say you're a girl, and thinking about going out with, with, with John, and all of your Bible study people know that he's not walking with Christ, or he's not a believer. And they say to you, you know, Sue Ellen, are you sure you want to go out with John? John boy's not a good guy, you know. He's not even walking with the Lord. He's not doing this. And God uses their speech, God uses their interaction to say, Maybe I shouldn't do that. And God convicts you. And He uses people in your life. Maybe you're reading the Bible one day, one morning, as you're going to start doing this year consistently. And as you read God's Word every day, and it starts to transform your life, and you're reading it, it says about not being anxious. And you realize, man, I've been anxious. What I've been anxious about this test. And as you read the verse, do not be anxious for anything, you say, Lord, I'm really sorry. I've been anxious. And God's Spirit convicts you through His Word. And as God's Spirit convicts you through His Word, you continue and you go back. And the whole process in the Christian life is we continue as we spend time in His Word, as we spend time with other Christians, as we spend time in fellowship with the Father through prayer and through His Word. As those things continue, our life grows and grows and grows. Now the problem is, is this. You're in the battle. I'm in the battle. Some of us at that point of conviction say, God... I don't care what happens. I'm going to disobey. I know that John's not a believer, and I know that he doesn't love God, but I haven't had a date in two years. I'm going to go out anyway. 
And you bow. Lord, I know that this is uh, that this is sinful, and I shouldn't do this, or I shouldn't purchase this, or I shouldn't go here, or I shouldn't look at this, or I shouldn't download this app, or whatever it is. But God, I don't care. I want this. And as soon as we take the throne of our life, over time, what ends up happening is Christ is okay, and we start to live instead of living a spirit-filled life, we start to live a carnal or worldly life. It's where Christ is still in the life. But we're taking control. It's like we're driving the car. We're the ones in charge. And a lifestyle of doing that shows that sense of carnality. And I tell you, if that is your lifestyle, I want to say this up front. If your lifestyle is that of disobeying and always rebelling against the Father's wishes and not doing what He asks you to do, you may not be a Christian at all. If you're always, if your lifestyle, your pattern of your life is that of disobedience, it may be, according to 1 John, the purpose of that happening is to show you that you're not a follower of Christ at all. Maybe you just look like it on a good day, but you're not following Christ at all. But I will say this. I lived nine years of my Christian life like that. Living a self-centered Christian life. Not out of rebellion, but out of ignorance. If I was to ask you, why do people live a a self-centered life? And I believe the answer to that is one of two things. One is, they either they are fearful, actually three things. One is, could be rebellion. They simply say, I don't want to do this. You know, if I really put Christ first and the Lord of my life, I want to have to, you know, marry an ugly, date an ugly girl, marry an ugly girl, uh, have ugly kids, drive an ugly car, and have an ugly dog. You know, and I'm going to have to do this and have a job I don't like. I'll be miserable and be straightly sober and sad the rest of my life. And, and that's what some people think, and I, but that's often driven by fear. And sometimes people do not trust Christ totally with their life and yield Him the throne of their life out of fear. If I give up my life completely... Even, even as Heather said earlier, and let him have it all, what's going to make me do? Some of you here, you have not been struggling with the sense of not being a Christian, but since, since you've been to encounter, you have been struggling with, God, do I give my life to you fully or not? God, do I give my steering wheel of my life to you? Or am I going to hold on to my life? And out of fear, you hold on My first degree in seminary was in missiology. Missiology is a fancy word for missions. And one of the times we were studying missions, we had actually a missionary come in. I forgot what what country he was from. But in the country he came from, they caught monkeys. And they ate monkeys in that part of the the world. And he said, you know how to catch monkeys? It's really kind of hilarious. Uh, Do you know how to catch monkeys? It's kind of fun. What they do to to catch a monkey, all you have to do is find a hollow tree. um, And what you do in the hollow tree is you cut a hole about the size of a monkey's hand. And the hand's closed like this. But this big. And then you put grain or berries or whatever it is that monkeys are eating that time of the year. You stick those grain or berries into that tree uh, after you kind of hollow it out a little bit. And then you just kind of chill out and you wait for the monkeys. And so the monkeys smell the, the, the grain or they, they smell the berries and they, they find the trail that you have led to them. And then those monkeys stick their hand inside that hollow tree and grab a handful of grain. But when their hand is so full of grain, what happens? The hand is too big to get out of the hole. And so it's stuck. <laughs> you know, they're sitting back here kind of, and there's, the monkey is stuck in his hand. And all the monkey has to do is to go free, is to let go. And if he lets go, or it lets go, it goes free. But the monkey is so self-centered. And the monkey is so very fearful of not being able to get something else to eat that it hangs, hangs on to that grain. And so the farmer or the the hunter just listens for the monkey. And once a monkey hears a monkey stuck, he says, great, I got me a monkey. And he walks up and the monkey stays there until the guy gets there. The monkey, then the guy just chops the monkey's head off and walks away. Because why? He didn't have to. The monkey won't let go. And I tell you, some of you are like that monkey. You are holding on to areas of your life right now at this conference. And God's saying, let it go. No, 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 I got this. I gotta help, you know, he's cute. I, I've dated him for two years. I gotta keep dating him. Or I've dated her for this. I gotta keep doing this. Or, you know, my, this is, my parents say I've got a lot. I do this. Or, you know, my, my professors say I've got a lot. And you're holding on to that, to that idol in your life. And I tell you, 
if you're living a self-centered life and self's on the throne, you're holding on. I want to encourage you. Let it go. Release it. And you'll be free to, do, to enjoy what God really wants to do in your life. Another reason why we don't give our life fully over to Christ is out of ignorance. For me, it was ignorance. I did not know that Jesus wanted to be in control of my life. I did not know that Jesus Christ wanted to be center front of my life. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18 is a passage I quoted this morning, but it's a passage that relates to this that helps us to understand the filling of God's Spirit. Ephesians 5, 18. When you, when you find that, someone read it and stand up and read it out loud. Let's go for it. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. Some versions may say that is excess. Other versions say, you know, that, you're, that this is dissipation. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation or debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to unpack that verse a second. There's a couple things in that verse. First of all, there's a comparison in that verse. Catch the comparison? The comparison is a person drinking, being drunk with wine versus being, being filled with the Spirit. When a person is drunk, when my dad, a guy that was an alcoholic, when my father was drunk, he, he would walk differently, he would talk differently, he would go places he wouldn't normally go, he would say things he wouldn't normally say, he would act in ways he wouldn't normally act. Why? Because the alcohol or the effects of the alcohol controlled his life. He was filled with alcohol. And instead of being filled with alcohol, it says, don't get drunk with wine or don't get drunk with anything outside of God. Don't, don't let anything else. Some of you are filled with fear. And you walked into this conference today or this week into encounter scared to death about anything. And you're fearful of missing out. You're fearful of whatever the situation is. And some of you are filled with anger like I was. That, that's what you are. Some of us are, are, are filled with insecurity. What that scripture tells us is not to be filled with alcohol or anything else, but to be filled with the Spirit. There's a, there's a comparison. There's a command. What is the command? The command there is be filled. Now it's interesting. Earlier we looked at the verses, or I gave the verses to look about being baptized and then dwelt and filled. No place in the Bible are we told to be, are we commanded to be baptized in the Spirit. No place are we commanded to be and dwelt with God's Spirit. No place are we commanded to be sealed with God's Spirit. No place are we commanded to be regenerated by God's Spirit. Those things God does to us. He, we don't, it, we're not told to do those. They happen to us. But we are told to be filled. He commands you. He commands me. Don't get drunk with wine, but you be filled. It's in the present imperative. You do it now, and you keep doing it. And it's in the passive voice, meaning this, that, that, not, that we don't fill ourselves, but God fills us. He's the one that empowers our life. It's Him doing it through us. All I have to do is let go and say, God, this is it. You can have my life. There's a, there's a command. There's a comparison. And the other thing is, is there's consequences. And those consequences are in verse 19, 20, and 21. The consequences of being filled with God's Spirit is we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing and making melody in our hearts to God, that we live in a submissive spirit, that God transforms our attitude. He transforms our behavior. He transforms how we live the Christian life and how we live life in general because we are filled with His Spirit. Now let me ask you a question. How, of those three bottom circles, which one represents your life? Think a second. Some of you here may be on the far left where you're not a believer yet. And again, don't leave this conference. Don't leave today until you give your life to Christ as, he's, as your Lord and Savior. Some of you are in the process. You're the believer in Christ is in the, is in, has the control of your life. He's on the throne. And you're moving forward in the Christian life very effectively. And you're doing great. Others of you, I believe, are on the right-hand side. Where Christ is in your life, but you still have the steering wheel. You still have your hand in that tree. And you're saying, yeah, this is my life, and I'll do what I want to do. There's a couple of things you need to do in the process of that. The thing written down over here um, is under the command to be filled, desire, confess, yield, and by faith. What I learned that day in April the 14th, 1978, to do these four things. First of all, I have to desire. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed is the man who hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for he shall be satisfied. Do you want Jesus Christ to be on the throne of your life? Yes or no? 
If you do not have a desire, he is not going to force his hand. If you want to continue to live in fear, he's going to say, okay. If you want to act that way, go ahead. You're going to be a disappointed child. But what do you do you do you want Jesus Christ to be in control at the center of your life? That's the first thing. Secondly, you need to confess. It's in your notes there as well. First John 1 9 says, if we are if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word confession is the word homo legeo. It mean, in the original language, it means homo means the same, legeo means to speak. It means to speak the same. It means to say the same thing that God says about your life. So to confess, what does that mean? That means you say, God, I am sorry. I have been in control of my own life, and as a result, I sinned against you. And Lord, I've done this wrong, and I've done this wrong, and I've done this wrong. And you say the same thing about your sins. You don't rationalize it. You don't say, well, it's not my fault. I didn't know about it. You don't, you don't, you don't act like it's someone else's fault. You don't play the victim. You admit your own sin. What did they do in Genesis uh, 2 and 3? Uh, when, at the fall, Adam blamed Eve. Eve first blamed the devil. And then Adam blamed Eve. What took place. And they didn't, until they took ownership of their own life, they don't experience that forgiveness. And you're the same way, and I'm the same way. There's three C's of confession. You need to call it sin. You need to call it forgiven. Then you need to call on God to change you. The three C's of confession. First of all, call it sin. Don't rationalize it. What I have done, God, is wrong. It is sin. It's not a mistake. It's not a bad day. It was sin. You call it sin. God calls it sin. You call it sin. You call it forgiven. When did Jesus Christ forgive your sin? He forgave your sin when you became a believer in Christ. He forgave all of your sins, past, present, and future. Why do we confess? We confess to, to cleanse that fellowship, to make that relationship. We have judicial forgiveness at the cross when we, when we trust Christ as our Savior. We have experiential forgiveness every time I confess been married for 35 years, uh, be 36 years this summer, my wife and I, and uh, I was asked not long ago, I actually about, uh, about two weeks ago, went out with a couple that were starting to date some, uh, as a professor, and we were, he was a single professor, was going out with another individual, they said, Can't give us advice about dating, because they could tell that they're getting closer and closer, and as we started talking, I said, well, the thing that you need to understand is when you get married, or when you date, you, it's two sinful people dating each other, and that both people need to be forgiven. And the number one thing that you're going to, so besides, besides your personal walk with Christ, in your relationship once a person gets married, is the willingness to forgive. Because if you can't forgive your spouse consistently, you're not going to make it. Isn't that right? I mean, it's just life. I know his wife, and, I, and she told me the other day, she said, look, it's really messing up. No, it's it. But, you know, in our, in our life, we basically, that's what marriage is. It's forgiving. It's, it's, it's two forgiven people forgiving each other ongoingly. And so you call it sin, you call it forgiven, and Christ has forgiven you on the cross. And then you call on God to change you. True repentance, true confession always involves repentance. If I'm really sincere about my confessing my sin, I confess. And I repent of it. And so if you're having struggle with your thought life, and because you get things on your iPhone... And you're thinking, I shouldn't look at this, but I'm sorry, God. Then you better do something about it. Then you get an accountability partner. You get an app on your phone that keeps you from looking at that stuff. You get a bad, you get a, get rid of your, your your iPhone. You know, get one of these. I'm, I'm bringing them back in style. It's called a flip phone. And it actually works. And I can send a text, and you can send a text, and we can text each other. I can even take a picture if I want to. You can't really see it. But it's actually there. But I don't get on the Internet. I don't need to go on the Internet. I'm not that important. No, I don't need to check my email every two seconds. Um, you're not that important either. No one, it's just relax. But if your phone is causing you problems, then get rid of that phone if necessary. Whatever it takes, if you, what does the scripture say? If your eye causes you to sin, what do you do? Pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, what do you do? Cut it off. If your phone calls you to sin, what do you do? Get a flip phone. I mean, you get rid of it. I mean, that's a new version of the Bible we're going to talk about. But you need to understand that con true confession revolves, involves repentance and a, trans and a change of our behavior. So you desire, you confess, and then the next thing you do is you yield. You say, okay, Christ, you take control of my life. Jesus, would you stand on the chair? I give it up. Lord, would you take the steering wheel? Lord, 
I let go, and you can have my life. You have to yield. You have to choke. He's not going to force his hand, your hand. You let go. And then lastly, it's by faith. How did you receive Christ your Savior? It says in Ephesians, by faith. How do you walk with Him? You walk by faith. As we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, it says in Colossians 2, so walk in Him. How did you receive Christ by faith? How do you walk with Him? You walk with Him by faith. And what happens in that process, you go from the land of immaturity to the land of maturity. It's fantastic. It is wonderful. It's God living His life and His, His, His life through you. And it's transforming your life, not as you having control, but Jesus Christ having control of your life. It was April the 14th, 1978, when I first heard that. And I thought, this is great. This is remarkable. I mean, it's that simple? Yes. Because it's Christ living in me and through me. But on your diagram, there's another circle that I put in there. And it's, I've called it the counterfeit. It's interesting, the other professor who's speaking is talking about the counterfeit. I thought, did she see my diagram? I mean, I wonder if it's the same kind of idea because it's a counterfeit type of faith. And what, if we're not careful, especially if you're a crusty crusader, how many of y'all been involved in crew over three years, Mr. Your hand? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, you've heard everything before. You've heard all the talks. You've heard everything. Oh, yeah. I've memorized that book. I've memorized my whole, that whole Bible. If you're not careful, you become the church man. And the church man is a person that trusts in his own efforts to live the Christian life. It's the self-effort life. That's what it talks about there. It goes in that direction. And it's in such a way, and the difference here is the person that's a church man, his life looks really good. You know, he's reading his Bible, or she's praying, or she's going to church, or she's maybe leading a Bible study. But what is he or she doing? They're trusting in their own abilities to live the Christian life. And what they have done is this. They've interpreted the Christian life to look like this rowboat. And i got an illustration for you. I brought my oar. It comes apart, that's what I got in my, in my suitcase. And what we do, if we're not careful, is we basically interpret the Christian life uh, as like it's our efforts to row the boat. And so, basically, we are looking at life, and we hear a person talk about the Word, like maybe yesterday, one of the preachers, or one of the ministers, say, man, and you say, i got to read God's Word more. You know, and I really have to put effort into that. Then, all of a sudden, you hear a person talk on prayer. Oh, I need to pray more. And you pull out the oar of prayer, and you, and you really pray hard. And then they think, oh, I need to witness, like the person said, and we're going to witness tomorrow, so that'll be better. And then you start witnessing. Then you say, oh, community, fellowship. And you start, oh, i gotta, I got a fellowship. And you think, hey, this is good. This is pretty good. I can do it one hand. You know, and you, you start if you're not careful in the Christian life. And what do you rely upon? You rely upon how disciplined you are to live the Christian life. And if you pray, if you pray a lot, you're okay. If you're in the Word a lot, you're doing pretty good. You know, if you're in good fellowship, I'm, gonna, I'm not only going to go to crew on Thursday night. I'm going to go to CSF on Tuesday night and SCA on Monday night. I'm going to go to BCM on Wednesday night. I'm going to go to every other church in town. I'm going to be involved in cover all my bases. Why would you do that? Only if it's self-effort. You know, and it's a sense of entitlement that you're going after it so intensely and it doesn't work. Because what that is, it, it, it would work if you're rowing across a pond. But you're not, the Christian life's not rolling across the pond. It's going across an ocean. It's a life, an entire life. And what often happens, a lot of Christians start that process, and then they get tired, and they say, man. And you get in Leviticus in about February, and you think, man, Leviticus is tough. And then you get into, you read into the Bible, and you get to another book, and you think, I think I'll just quit. And then you think, oh, my prayers aren't being answered, and so I just maybe I'll stop praying. And you're not, and you start trusting. You can, you decide that trusting your efforts don't work, but you have to keep. You still almost focus as a facade. You look good on the outside, but inside, there's no joy, there's no peace, there's no sense of excitement for what God's doing. This is well. I guess I'll read the Bible again today. And what you have done is this. You misunderstood, and the counterfeit that you have done is the rowboat. But you need to understand, the Christian life's not a rowboat. It's a sailboat. Have you ever gone sailing? 
I've only gone a few times. On my wife's 30, on our 30th anniversary, someone gave us uh, a week in the Virgin Islands. It, 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 we had to get there, but we got to be in the Virgin Islands for a week. It was remarkable. It was just phenomenal. And we went on a sailing trip. We sailed from the from St. Thomas to the Christmas uh, Christmas Island, what they call it. And it's about a two hour tour, you know, you know, something like the Island thing. We do, we sailed for two or three hours and got to the island. Then we snorkeled around the island, and we just had a great day. Then we we sailed, we sailed back. And sailing is remarkable because when you sail, what do you do? You get your oar and you paddle a lot, don't you? No, you just get there, and the wind pushes the boat through the water. Now, what you do is you control the angle of the sail. And you also use the rudder to give, make sure that you're, going in a, that you're going in the right direction. It kind of steers it. But you don't empower your own life. You don't empower the boat. The boat is empowered. The boat is filled with wind. The sail is filled with wind. And when the sail is filled with wind, the boat goes through the water. That's exactly the picture of the Christian life. It's not you trying harder. It's not you praying more or reading the Bible more or working harder at the Christian life, being more disciplined, though this discipline is important. But only a discipline as you are filled with God's Spirit works. But it's God filling the sail of your life and empowering you in the Christian life. Does that make sense? About 15, 20 years ago is when I first drew this out. And I was actually at a conference in Orlando, Florida at our headquarters. And I was talking to some other directors, and I said, I got a diagram I want to show you. I said, because I believe a lot of Christians, especially in the South, are church men. Meaning they look good on the outside, and they're trying hard, but they're very dis disappointed. They're not rebelling against God, but they just, they're not living the Christian life in any sense of joy or fulfillment. They're, they're, they're sucking it up, and they're working hard at it. And then I drew out this diagram and gave the picture of the sailboat. And this friend of mine, who had been a campus director with crew, for ten years, uh, for seven years at that point, I said, "Oh, me, Thomas, that's me." He said, "I think I've done my entire Christian life on staff, rowing the boat. I have trusted in my efforts instead of trusting in Christ. No wonder I'm so frustrated." And I tell you, I believe some of you here, if not many of you here, are struggling with that problem. You have been rowing your boat. And you're thinking, even you've even written down, I'm going to do this when I get back. I'm going to do this when I get back. I'm going to do this when I get back. And all these things you're going to do. And you, you probably should do those things. But not empowered by your own flesh. Not you trying hard. But you abiding in Christ. You yielding yourself to Christ. And saying, Jesus, would you live your life through me? <coughs> would you fill me with your spirit? Would you take control of my life and enable me? Heather talked about it in her third point. I forgot what the point, main point was, but she said it's not achievement, but it's abiding. I think it says not achievement, but it's abiding. It's abiding in Christ. Let me ask you, of those four circles on the bottom, which represent your life? A few of you are on the left. Some of you are in the center. I would say... Chances are a number of you are on the carnal worldly or the self-effort life in Christ. Another question is more important, and that is, which one do you want to have true in your life? I want to close this section before I have a Q&A time with a prayer, with a time of confession, a, a time of, not confession, but a, a time of yieldedness. And I'm going to give you the chance to decide where you want to be. You know, as you look at it, do you want to live a self-directed life or a life filled with God's Spirit to that command and experiencing His power to live and to Him to walk in with Him, Jesus Christ, to live in you and through you. Rich circle represents your life. Which one do you want to have represent your life? If you would like to have Christ as center of your life, Pray after me right now. But let's take a second as we pray just to examine your own life. Dear Father, I pray that we would truly examine ourselves right now. And Lord, there would be a sense of honesty amongst each person here. And if you are not living a spiritual life right now, 
Christ isn't in complete control, would you yield your life to him now? And simply pray. That's what I pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross of my sins. Lord, I am sorry that I have been directing at my own life. And as a result, I've sinned against you. Lord Jesus, take control of the throne of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit as you commanded me to be filled. Change my life. Transform me. Empower me to live a life that only you can live for your glory. I pray this to Jesus in your name. Amen. That decision of being filled with the Spirit is a daily decision. It happens all the time. When you wake up, when you go to bed, Lord, come with your Spirit. Lord, speak through me. There will, become, there will be times in your life where you will take the weak control of throwing your life and you will have to say, Lord, you might even make out a sin list. I've done it before. I've got on a piece of paper and I've listed out the sins I've done and I said, Lord, I am sorry. And I, Lord, would you retake the throne of my life? Would you take complete control and I yield myself to you? Other times, it's that just that daily sense of, okay, it's called spiritual breathing. You, you confess, you exhale the bad, and you inhale the good. You exhale the bad, and you inhale the good. You exhale your sin, and then you inhale His feeling or saying, Jesus, I yield my life to you. It's that daily walk. It's that daily sense of, Lord, I trust you. Would you live your life through me today? And I'm convinced that as you do that in your life, that you will start to see your life transformed over time. Not perfected, not perfect, because you're still going to battle with issues. But as those issues come up, God is going to show you how to overcome that in His victory uh, for His glory, not for your own. Make sense? Questions before I dismiss you? Any things you'd like to ask as we talk about that song? on this ministry, or anything else as far as that goes. You're going to talk about who's in one Super Bowl. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know that at all. Yes? Um, so, Heather talked about um, being available. Yes. I like that corresponds a lot. So, do you have, like, a personal story, kind like her, of where you were available and what just your yeah, I, I, especially in areas of witnessing. I mean, yeah. it's phenomenal. So, yeah. And the question is, Heather talked about the availability. God does not need your ability. He needs your ab availability. Okay, that's all, God, you just need to be available to the Lord. God, would you speak to me? Would you use me? Uh, there have been a number of situations. One with my with my brother with my uh, brother in law. My sister married a non believer. She was not told not to marry a non believer. She didn't even understand that she shouldn't. After three or four years of marriage, she realized, oh no, I've married an unbeliever. And what am I going to do? I went to my first summer project. Actually, I went to to Colorado for the summer project. Started praying every day for my brother in law's salvation. And I got back from the summer project, and my friends prayed for him as well. And we started praying, Lord, would you work in my brother-in-law's life? And so we went to his house after the summer project. My, my fiancé at the time at that point went to his house just to, to have lunch with him. And I started praying, Lord, would you open the conversation to talk about Christ? And it was remarkable. I showed some pictures. And one of the pictures was I had gotten thrown in a pool and with a bunch of my friends, and I had a, I had a four spiritual laws booklet or knowing God personally booklet in my pocket. And when it got wet, it was real sticky, so we tore it apart and we stuck it on my shirt. And I walked around with these four laws attached to my shirt, knowing God personally. And my brother-in-law said, "Hey, Thomas, what is that?" And I thought. Thank you, Lord. And I said, well, let me show you. And I had it in my pocket, and I pulled it out. And I went through uh, knowing God personally, the four spiritual laws, the gold book that we use. And he trusted Christ. Did the same. I mean, I mean, this situation, it's just, Lord, would you work in my life? Would you use me today? Sometimes it's just taking the initiative. Other times it's just walking through life. You know, I had a situation we meet with all the, all the other campus directors in our region about a few years ago. One of the things I often do at a restaurant Waitress comes up to me and I said, "Hey, I said we're going to pray for our meal. Can I? Is there anything I can pray for you about?" And uh, I'll just ask them, and that kind of shocks them. They say, "Well, yeah." And I, we were all together at a steak place. There were four thirty of us, and one of the waitresses came in there, and I said, "Anything I can pray for you about? We're going to pray for our meal." She said, "Well, thank you." And she almost she teared up. She said, "Yeah." She said, "I've got an entrance payment. I'm a single mom raising two kids, one kid or two kids. I have an entrance payment on my car, and I can't afford to pay for it." And she said, I, I need money. Uh, and she said, you, would you pray that I could get extra hours or something? I forget what she exact prayer it was at that point. I said, I sure will. And so I said, well, how much do you need? And she said, I think I need 120 bucks, whatever it was. 
And uh, so we prayed for her over a meal. And then I thought, God said, Thomas, raise the money. Okay. So I went to all the directors. And I said, hey, this waitress needs $125 to pay for her insurance. Let's take up a collection. I said, that's a great idea. So we went around, and I collected $150, whatever it was. And as she, I left, I said, we're the followers of Christ. Christ is my Savior. And we'd like to give this to you as an answer to your prayer. And it blew her out of the water. I mean, a $150 tip uh, by a guy she didn't even know. And the manager came out after that, and he said, who are y'all? He said, this is really weird. We were all we were in Asheville, North Carolina when it happened. We were all from all over the country, I mean, all of the Mid-South. And they said, they said, he said, who are you? You guys are weird. And uh, he said, this is great that you did this, but you always do this kind of thing? And uh, it was an opportunity to share Christ. And so he's just opening your mouth. You just never know what God's going to do and what God's going to say in the midst of that. that I, I will say this as well. As a Christian, often we all struggle with a low degree of guilt. All right? Bottom, to be honest, you may feel guilty today. Yeah, I didn't read the Bible this morning like I should have. I mean, we basically, have, all of us have this, we battle with the low degree of guilt because we never pray enough, we never read the God's Word enough, we never witness enough, we never do any that kind of stuff enough. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I feel like a worm, you know. You know, I'm a rotten Christian, dirty Christian, rotten Christian, dirty Christian. That's a, such a holy Christian. Oh, if I could only be like this person. No, 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 no. That's why Heather's talk was so good. But when I, I, I always want to share my faith. I always want to share Christ. I didn't know how to do it. I remember my best friend was a non-believer named James. And all I needed to do was invite him to come to church. And I remember inviting him to come to church. I was mowing the yard, praying, Lord, I pray you would work in James' life, so I'll invite him to come to church. I thought, is that it? I got involved in crew, learned how to share the knowing God personally, and I shared it with him, and he trusted Christ. Oh, oh, you know, my best friend in high school, my best friend growing up, my brother-in-law, my father-in-law. I've had someone trust Christ with me. And listen, I'm a redneck, white trash, no poor kid growing up with nothing. The first week they'd ever go to college, the first week they'd ever go do anything. All my families were, were alcoholics. We had cars on the back in our backyard on blocks. I mean, um, redneck, white trash family. That's how I grew up. Not knowing anything. And... I learned how to share Christ. And I've had the privilege of leading someone to Christ every year for thirty for almost forty years. At least one person, if not five or six, or fifteen or twenty or thirty or forty. It's simple. I just share it. I'm not good. It's not that I'm so good. It's just it works. And if you're filled with the Spirit, God gives you the privilege to talk to people. And you talk to them, and guess what happens? They trust Christ for some reason. Duh. Why? Because of Christ. He's more concerned than you are about their faith. Good question. I'm sorry I kept going. Other questions you want to ask? Anything else you'd like to ask? Yes. I've got some friends in school that I've like talked with about spiritual things and um, share the gospel with and haven't really seen any fruit in their life. Is there something that I'm doing wrong or is it just not the right time? It's probably not the right time. You know, I think, I, are you doing something wrong? We probably need a longer conversation than 10 seconds. But chances are you're not. Chances are you just share Christ. My, our good friend Earl Shute, the director of Encounter, he says, don't bruise the fruit. And his point is, everybody's in a journey. And we enter people's life at certain points of the journey. And I need to think, I'm there, Lord, what's my next step to help that person to go the next step? And it may be that me just praying for that person, or maybe me not even talking to them, but backing off, thinking this person's been bruised by somebody else. I need to back away and not, not push them uh, and be sensitive to God's Spirit. And so walk your talk, live your life in front of them, and pray for them. And say, hey, how can I encourage you? Can tell me about your journey. People like to talk about their journey. Ask about their journey. There's different things you could potentially do, different ways you can pray, but chances are it's just not time yet. And we've got to let people, God, work in their life as God wants to work in their life. Don't bruise the fruit. If you do, uh, they'll, they'll return to Christ. Or they won't. Other thoughts, questions? Two or three more minutes work for recovery. Yes, see your hand. So, so it seems, it seems to me that you, that you wish that evangelism is much more effective than you can like them me like walking around. The question is, is relational evangelism better than walking around talking to people? Basically, that kind of, kind of your question? Is it more effective? Uh, is relational evangelism more effective than random evangelism or walking up to anybody? Okay, let me tell you two stories. Uh, no, yes. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I will say this. 
uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Okay, and people that you know that you're the closest with. Uh, that relationship's going to woo them to the gospel, just like Heather talked about the people that she walked with. But how many times have you been asked, hey, can you tell me, you look like Jesus. Will you tell me about him? That doesn't happen very often. Seldom does that happen. And so we are told to go tell. We are told to proclaim the gospel. We are told to present the gospel. We are told to talk about the gospel. And so, yes, relational evangelism is crucial. Um, but where is the power? Is it, is it in your relationship? Is it in your, in your testimony? No. The power is in the gospel. Romans 1.16. For the power of the gospel, is, for the gospel is a power unto salvation to those who believe. And if they don't hear the gospel, if they don't hear the message, then they're not going to trust Christ. They may just think that you're a good Mormon. Or they may just think that you're a good secularist. Or they may just think that you're a good whoever. If you don't, if you don't talk to them about the person of Christ. And so that's where you have to be sensitive. I shared Christ with my father-in-law uh, for 30 years. 30 years. My wife shared Christ with him for 45 years. My wife prayed for my father-in-law for 45 years. When the first time that I met him, I went to know him personally with him. He said, Thomas, this is great. I'm not interested. I said, okay. Ten years later, we went to it again. Thomas, this is great. I'm not interested. That's great. Ten years later, Thomas, this is great. I'm not interested. Five years before he died, he had cancer. I went through it again with him. And uh, he said, yes, I want to trust Christ. And I said, what? I thought, what in the world did you just say? And I said, you sure? He said, yeah. And I said, H, I've asked you this for 25 years. Why do you want to change? He said, I have watched you and Laurie for 30 years. And I want what you have. And he gives up to Christ. My wife had gone to the bathroom to pray because she was, she was so, she was so, this was such an intense conversation. And her first prayer she ever heard her dad say was, Jesus, will you save me? Wasn't that wonderful? She prayed for 45 years for her dad. Don't give up. <laughs> it may take 45 years. Uh, now, the other side of the coin is, since the, the gospel is the power of the salvation, I had a friend that was talking on evangelism. And uh, he was being taught on how to share Christ and, and really how to communicate and uh, he said, well, this is what I need to do. So he went to, the la he went to the laundromat to practice reading through the booklet so he could know what the booklet said. He's reading, through it, reading it to himself. Uh, a, a friend walked up to him, and was, he was at a table. His friend looked over his shoulder, and he said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading this booklet. I'm reading this booklet that, 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 taught, that I got, got in a class called Knowing God Personally. And he said, great. He said, would you read it to me? He said, sure. And so he was sitting down reading like this. His friend was over his shoulder, and he read it. This law one says God loves you. Law two says you're sinful. That's all he did. He just read it, never looking at the guy, never being creative, never engaging him. And then he heard a sniffle. And then he got to the part about praying to receive Christ, and the guy said, he said, what happened? He said, can I pray that? Can I trust Christ? <laughs> he said, I guess. And so he led into Christ. I mean, the first time he ever did it, and he did it, the wrong way. <laughs> you don't do it that way. It doesn't make any difference though because what does God do? God blesses the message, not the messenger. And He will bless the messenger as well, but the focus is God, God in His Word. One more question from somebody else. Yes? Because sometimes we are. Sometimes we're pushy, and we we're, we're sometimes we act like idiots. And I mean, so when I have situations like that, I apologize. I talked to a student recently who uh, had been a, raised in a Christian home, um, but basically had rejected Christ. And a professor and I talked to him. Another professor's student said, "Would you talk with me and with this person?" So we were talking together with him, and I I said, "It's evident that you have been hurt. Evidently, you have been hurt." And I'm really sorry. I don't know what's happened, but uh, but I, 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 as, as speaking as a Christian, would you please forgive us? We're really so, I'm really sorry for you being hurt by other, other Christians. And so sometimes the best thing to do is to say, you're right. How, you've been hurt. How have you been hurt? And, you know, how can I pray for you? You know, I'm really sorry. You know, people, people reject Christians. They don't reject Christ. And people have rejected a poor caricature of him. So they look at us and they think, we're just idiots, and we are. Christ wasn't. But when a person really sees a person of Christ for who he is, they say they embrace him and say, yes, 
That's who I want. So we need to live that out in the front before that person and over time be available and see what God does in their life. Thank you for coming. I, I want to leave you with this. Uh, uh, Joey, there on your you can download the app on your phone. Is what's give, give me a quick instructions. God tools. Go to God tools on your phone. Uh, that's the good thing about your phone. Uh, if you're going to use it, God tools on your phone and look for satisfied book. Some of the things that's not the whole thing, but what I talked about today is in that on the thing called satisfied. It's a way to communicate with Christ uh, to a person who knows Christ but who's not walking with Him. Do not leave here without Christ being the Lord of every area of your life. Being filled with His Spirit. Allowing Him to live in you and through you for your glory. Let me pray. Father, thank You for our time. Uh, thank You for these students and committing their time at this conference. And Lord, may this be a changing, a turn point, turning point, a new chapter in many of these students' lives as they're here at Encounter, as they understand what it means to walk in the power of Your Spirit. I pray this, Jesus, in Your name. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of the conference.